So especially with like ADHD, there's information coming to you from a million places these days. A lot of it's noise, but if you're like following the stock market, you want to, you know, understand what's going on. We try to make it, we try to condense it. So we do it in bold. Who? The what? The where? Why? Did, and what's this mean? What's this mean for you? That's what our RO, we try to do with our content to make it super simple to go where you want to read it. And that's what I like to read. So part of that is continuing to fight to make stuff easier to read, to understand, be it financial, be it sports, be it politics, like the who, what, the where, why, and get, you know, what's it mean? What's it mean to you? Welcome to Successful with ADHD. I'm Brooke Schnittman. Let's get started. Welcome back to Successful with ADHD. Today I have Jason Rasnick. He's a passionate entrepreneur and founder of the Detroit-based Benzinga, which is a financial content ecosystem, and it makes information much easier to consume. So ADHD years, financial stuff, we're going to get into all of that. And Jason actually has ADHD and it hit, and he created this. It was Jason's mission to connect the world with news, data, and education that makes the path to financial prosperity easier for everyone every day. And we know that we can definitely use that as fellow ADHDers. Benziga is read by more than 25 million people every month, and he's the host of the Raz Report podcast, where each week he interviews successful people who change the world. Jason was a winner of 2021 Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year for Michigan, Ohio regions and named to the Cranes Detroit Business 40 Under 40 list, as well as the Business 30 in their 30s list. Jason has also been quoted in a variety of financial news publications, such as CNBC, Wall Street Journal, New York Post, and he graduated from the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. He founded two successful digital startups as a student and currently resides in the metro Detroit area with his wife and three kids. And if that wasn't enough, in his free time, Jason's an avid golfer, a flag football coach for his son, Josh's team. All right. Welcome, Jason. Big intro there. I got a lot to live up to here. Thank you for having me on, Brooke. It's very exciting. You're, you're awesome. So thanks for having me on. Well, thank you for being on. I love hosting awesome people like yourself. So Jason's not just here to share how he makes finance easier for all people, including ADHDers. Jason actually has a diagnosis of ADHD. So Jason would love to just get into a little bit of when you learned you had ADHD and what life was like at that time. Yeah. I mean, it's going back many years. I know you and I talked about this in the past on, I think, you know, on the Raz Report podcast, but. I, uh, in second grade, my parents told me, or I don't know, I was told that I, you know, taped myself to my seat. So I was in elementary school, Lone Pine, sitting in second grade, and I think I took scotch tape and like taped my, you know, hands to my seat because, you know, very fidgety, very moving around and uh, driven to distractions. And then also that other part where ADHD years, you have, you have a lot of awareness of what's going on near you and you're in it. And you're just paying attention to stuff that arguably you shouldn't be paying attention to because you should just focus on the schoolwork. And so it was way back, you know, in history. No. So it was somewhere in the in 1980s where I was probably about 10 years old is my guess. I was young. So, yeah. And then just learning to live with that and use it as a strength and not a weakness. Learning to not find excuses to not get stuff done. Oh, I have ADHD. No. Use it as a strength. Figure out the ways that it works for you. And don't get me wrong, you know, listeners of your podcast, that takes years to do. And that's why people hire you as a coach and learn tips and mechanisms. And I, to this day, and I know I'm jumping, you know, still try to figure out how to do things. As, as Brooke knows, we were supposed to start the podcast like 10 minutes ago. And I was just like asking her questions before this started. So. Um, all right. So that's a little bit about totally fine and nothing wrong. No reason to shame yourself at all. So Jason, yes, we're human. And obviously a way to expand and grow is to continue to learn, right. And ask good questions. Yeah. So, okay. I was going to say one thing, Brooke, that I struggle with is 
Like, do I overthink it sometimes? Right? Like someone said to me this line, JFDI, and it stands for just F and do it, right? Instead yeah. of overthinking it. And I wonder sometimes ADHD or do we years do we overthink things i'm not sure if that's a if that's a common characteristic but oh, yes. i would love to hear your viewpoint on that oh yes i mean it's a double edged sword so we can be very impulsive and just do it on things that we've waited too long for or we get excited about but at the same time we definitely overthink our decisions because of the mistakes that we've made in the past thinking that we're not good enough to make the right decision. And that's where we can get paralyzed in our analysis paralysis and not make decisions, get stressed, anxious, depressed until it's too late and opportunities pass us by. So we can overthink things so much. And that's where a lot of the anxiety that is comorbid to ADHD comes along. That's interesting. And so one mechanism to deal with that, which is a terrible one, is just not to make the decision, not to do it, not to pay attention to it. So then you have the out to say, hey, I wasn't even focused on it. So that's, you know, like, um, but that's, you know, that's uh, interesting how you said that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a, like a lot that goes into that too, because sometimes when we pass opportunities or we pass decisions, we have good reasons for passing those and they weren't the right decisions. But other times we get so paralyzed that we feel bad that we haven't made a decision. So Again, yep. double-edged sword, lots to go into it and think about. But obviously, you've made a decision that has worked for you financially and has worked for 25 million people financially. And I'm curious how, with your ADHD diagnosis at 10, where you were taping yourself to the seat, how you shifted from there to creating this multi-million dollar global financial company. Yeah. I mean, I also remember being separated from the class sometimes, like going to the learning resource room and getting extra help and those kind of things. And I didn't really like that. I didn't like being separated. So at some point, I don't know if it was fifth grade or sixth grade, but at some point I turned a corner, I would say. And I had to work harder than my peers. There's no question. I had to work harder than my peers. Like I, I did. And where it may have come easier, the way I read was different than the other another person. And I just just put in the time and really focused and really and by the way, it's not to say like my mom and dad, but my mom, because she was taking me, like I went to tutors. I had got extra help in different things. Cause it wasn't just, you know, the HD, it was reading. It was mm -hmm. learning and learning how to deal with that and learning different ways to learn um, was part, you know, was part of the challenge. And I think fifth, sixth grade is when I like turned a corner, I would say in between those times, because that because then I eventually went on to do really well in school. I went to the University of Michigan and and I did well in school, et cetera. But there's a lady named Miss Kent who is in charge of the Learning Resource Center. She told my parents, if you could believe this that she didn't think I would ever be able to read. It's terrible. Yeah. So I gave a TEDx. <laughs> I've heard too many stories like that. <laughs> I, yeah, I gave a TEDx talk about it one day. Yeah, that's the story of the younger years, I guess. Mm, yeah. So I'm curious that, uh, did you know that Miss Kent at the time that you were struggling to read said that, or did your parents tell you that once you were able to read? Yeah, I think I learned that like once I was able to read. I don't think I knew that at the time. Okay. But if someone didn't believe that you'd ever be able to read, then I'm assuming they didn't really teach you. And so my mom, I went to this person like Pat Kostecki, who is amazing, who taught me to read. So we had to go to like a tutor to learn to read. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you had learning center, you went to a tutor, you got that support that you needed. You spent a lot more time in doing things to excel in school than your neurotypical peers. But yeah. how did you turn that corner in fifth and sixth grade? Like what changed once you did all of the tutoring and extra support services? I think it may have been honestly self-confidence, knowing that I could learn to read in a different way, I guess. Like I noticed grammar mistakes really quickly or spelling mistakes because the way I, way I learned to read, I think it's different than others. 
a lot of others don't notice these things and I notice them every time. It's I think it was once I learned to read once I learned to read, having the confidence, then putting in the time and going getting the extra help and just working hard and realize realizing you can do it if you're willing to put in the time. Gotcha. So you saw the results once you got that extra help to level the playing field. And right. then you got the confidence. And then with the confidence, it gives you that extra boost of motivation to continue to try hard. It sounds. Yeah, continue to try hard. Now, the, the, the like we're going back to those years, but I still probably did things too at the last minute. Like I needed deadlines. I still struggle with that where I need deadlines to get stuff done. So my ha habits sometimes were good, but a lot of times we, you know, go to high school years, I would be studying for the test the next day, like at two in the morning versus having a good night's sleep. I find people who don't have ADHD or I find a lot of times people are studying way in advance. I find mm -hmm. we like do things at the last minute. Um, cause we need that deadline or something or that fear yep. of failure to kickstart that dopamine, which then gives you the motivation to actually do the thing. Exactly. And I, and I feel like maybe that's what we say we need. I, I, I want to change that because I feel it's unneeded stress. That's where I feel, you know, I feel like it's something that there's no reason to have that stress. So it's like, figure out how to solve for it. You know, yeah. so that's uh part of the story. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because from the outside, you look like this big successful person who's created this financial news outlet to millions, right? And you did that. You did that, right? And you have a wife and you have three kids. And then on the inside, you're humble enough to share that you're still struggling with those prioritizations of deadlines. And, you know, you still find yourself waiting until the last minute, which causes you stress. And I'm curious, obviously there's tools and support for that, but how did you make all of this work in your life to build this huge company? So obviously there's, you know, let's say it's the team, the team, the team. It's not just me, but yes, I started it. I'm the one who made the hires. I'm the one who like started it and worked. 18 hours a day, hired contractors overseas and integrated into all these brokerage firms and did the work. I don't know. I, I, I partly, maybe it was, maybe it was people doubting that I could do it, you know, fear of failure, people leaving us and saying, oh, we're going to fail. Oh, this, that, and like just negative talk to us. And then when we had our, we, we, we had a, a partial exit where we sold a majority of the company to private equity for a you know a nice exit, but we're still we're still involved, and maybe it's that constant of proving the doubters wrong, I guess, and outworking and giving people what they want to read. I don't know, in essence, like you know how we were talking about how we wait to the last minute to get things done. In yeah. some respect, everything was like if I didn't get it done, then there was no business. I remember when I paid the first salary of $45,000 and I was like, holy cow, that's a crazy amount of money. I'm like, that's like $1,000 a week. If you're taking cash, it's almost, you know, and I was like, that's crazy. Now we pay a lot more than that now, but we had to make money to pay the salaries. You know how you said that, 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 that splash of dopamine or, you know, however you call it mm -hmm. that. And that splash of dopamine was happening all the time because you had to get these deals done to make payroll. And so mm -hmm. it was like you had that deadline there all the time, which I thought was probably kind of helpful in some respect. It gets harder when you don't necessarily have the deadline and you don't have someone like you have a coach. I have a coach and that helps with deadlines. Mm -hmm. It's just I don't want us to accept. Hey, OK, yeah, that's just who you are. You do things last minute. I'm trying to change that. I'm trying yeah. to get better because. I think, as you mentioned, opportunities, you, you pass them up. And um, I think living a part of a productive life is being semi-efficient with your time because the one thing we all have is 24 hours in a day. And it's, it's a great equalizer. Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that I'm saying you need to go work th those, all those hours because I don't, I don't think someone's better than someone else because they work 
18 hours a day. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is I think a lot of people with ADHD use their brain to make, make it more complicated in some respect, including myself, where, okay, I can get this thing done right now. Okay, so let's say I need to write you an email about mm-hmm. something and I'm procrastinating on it. And so I'm going to, th- and I'm supposed to get it to you by four o'clock. I'm procrastinating. It. I don't get to you at four o'clock. I get it to you at nine o'clock. How many times did I think about it in that period of six hours? I'm going to guess I thought about it 40 times, maybe 50, maybe 60. If we just did it, got it done, then we wouldn't think about it and we move on to the next thing. And I want to get to more of a life like that. And then sometimes I am. But I just think it, you need to be consistent. I think it may be hard for us, but I just, I don't know. That's where I'm trying to get to. Sure. So Dr. Hallowell, he's a leading ADHD expert, says that ADHDers are consistently inconsistent. So what I teach in my coaching is let's be persistent in our consistency, right? Consistently persistent. Yeah, so nice. if you thought about sending an email 40 to 60 times in a five-hour span, I wonder if potentially what was going through your mind is, ooh, how are they going to feel on the other side once they receive it? And do I have a follow-up answer? Or do I need to have the perfect response? Do I need to have all the pieces together now? The, I think it's partly the former. Like, you need to have the perfect thing that is written. And, and I'm not, not necessarily thinking what the response will be, but it's partly the former. I want to have the perfect thing. So perfection, you know, is a uh, enemy of getting things done. And you're like, I need to make this perfect. So you get it to 75% of the way. And then you're like struggle. And I think there are ways to deal with that by having others look at what you're doing and say, yeah. Hey, do you have any feedback on what this is? And then, then you can send it out. Yes. That's definitely a great way to conquer some of your perfectionism. Having that accountability partner to say, okay, it's good enough. Let's go send it out. Or you knowing ahead of time, like if you could picture what is good enough, what is 95%, what is 100% um, before you send it or even start it. But I think it's kind of funny that, so I'll get this thing done and I want to show it to someone here to like review and send out. I want them to review it immediately right then because I've already waited to the last minute. You know what I mean? If I would get it done early, then I'd give that person more time to review it. You know what I mean? So we get it done. And it's like the last one, like, hey, will you review it? No, review it now. And like, so our urgency, our emergency becomes their emergency. And that is, you know, disrespectful. I should get it done earlier. It's stressful. Kind of the stuff. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff I need to improve upon. But yeah, I, you know, started a company, hired people, you know, millions, you know, and built a decent sized company. And I think as someone who's listening to this podcast, like I said, I think there's a lot of um, strength someone has. You, n- you notice things more. You, um, mm-hmm. You're acutely aware of things. People may criticize you more because you go about things differently. And I think the more you do, sadly, I think you need, a, I think you need to create a bigger backbone because people like to tear people down. It's just what it is. If you go look at, society i look at people who are very successful if you go look on reddit or different places oh don't even get me started with reddit (laughs) it may it may be one person but they tear people down what i care about most i mean i want to grow the company but what i love is helping people achieve more than they could achieve on their own like like that they ever thought they could achieve on their own one of the guys who sits near me was like talking to someone and he was like all nervous because this person was a successful business person, whatever. I'm like, nervous? There's nothing to be nervous about. The person isn't better than you in any regard. They do different things than you. Like, there's nothing mm-hmm. to be nervous about. But others just go online and just, like you just said, like, like Reddit, for example. It is the platform for negative reviews on a lot of things. And, and, and mm-hmm. you know that one person, one person could have five of these negative, mean, five of the negative people are 10. And now with AI, you can do way more of it. And mm. it's, it's, that, it's that easy. So I asked one of these CEOs of a public company, I said, how does he handle it? And he said, he doesn't, look, he doesn't read it anymore. He, do, he just doesn't read it. And that's probably the best way. Yeah, I'm so glad that you're mentioning this because I am also a CEO of a company, not as big as 
than Zynga. It doesn't and, matter. But I, I it really doesn't matter. Says. But the bigger you get, the more exposure you have. And regardless, 20% of people are not going to like you upon regardless. meeting you. Regardless. It's unbelievable. And I love how you, you spoke to this friend of yours who said, I don't look at the reviews. Same thing with me, like on social media, when there's negative stuff that come from my posts, I have someone who looks at it and filters it out first, because I don't think my time, A, is worth being spent in that land. And B, yeah, it's going to make me feel like crap. Who wants to hear a negative thing about them, especially when you're doing your best and trying to help people and lives? Well, here's what sucks. Mm -hmm. Here's what sucks. Let's say you announce some news. You get 200 compliments or 200 whatever. You get one or two negative things. You remember the one or two That's negative it. things. And, and, and there's a publication. I don't want to say the name. The, found, the editor, he's not there anymore. It's, it's a publication that like closed down. They got sued. It's a media publication. Their model was, let's say Mark Cuban buys the, like a NFL team, Seattle Seahawks. Let's just make that up. But right, Mark Cuban owns another team. Yeah, you know, he got out of the NBA or he's still an NBA, but he owns it. This publication, they wanted to take a negative approach to everything because they knew that's what people would talk about. So that their headline would probably be like, Mark Cuban trying to own the world, taking over for the little, you know. And so that's what gets, and that's what's so sad. And that's what's like, I remember when we did our deal, I, I honestly, I think I got six, 400 text messages that day. It was, and, or the, or the couple, you know, and then like maybe one or two negative things on Twitter. I don't even remember what they were, but I, that's what you remember. And that's, it messes us up. And I telling you, the higher the flag goes, the, someone told me once, the higher the wind will blow. People just tear people down. And I, I don't, I don't get it. And I don't know if that's ADHD, but like, it's, it's so easy. It's so easy to go online and write a negative thing. It's also so it easy is. to go write a positive thing, but people, it makes them feel better. They see you doing well, Brooke, they're going to go and take you down. They see you making money. They're going to go and want to bring you to, to, you know, down to their level. That's it. I think that we have both types of people, right? And since 2020 mental health awareness has been on the rise and Depression and anxiety has gone up significantly and social media and online outlets are being used to send messages. You know, it's just a different form of messaging. I was interviewing Jason Pfeiffer from uh, Entrepreneur. He's the chief editor of Entrepreneur Magazine. And he was saying, you know, like these outlets aren't causing anxiety. They're not causing depression. It's the people who are trying to send these messages and they're using these platforms to send them and they're, they are already depressed or anxious. So I know I'm going on a tangent here, but I think that to come back to what you're trying to say is like, you are trying to help people. We, yes, as ADHDers, when we receive a negative message, it's so much more powerful than 200 positive messages. The negative messages stick to us like Velcro and the positive message come off of us like Teflon. I heard that from one of my mentors. Dr. Hallowell also mentions that if we get a positive review, just one, right? It can also be euphoric because people with ADHD from before the age of 10 get 20,000 more negative subliminal messages than neurotypical. So it resonates. It makes us feel less than, and we don't know. It's hard to differentiate. Oh, these are just not my type of people, or they don't understand me, or I don't really care about them. Who are they to judge mm -hmm. and think about I'm doing something for the greater good. And I can put my head down on a pillow at night and feel good about what I've done during the day. It's hard. It's really hard. But the bigger you get, the more negative messages and the more exposure you're going to get. I don't even know if people think they're being so negative and such haters all, all the time. And by the way, I'm not saying I'm perfect at, at, by any means. One, th one exercise I do with myself, or I try to, is driving. So someone cuts you off or something happens, or someone says something to you, you the first reaction is to get upset and defensive. The other one mm -hmm. is to just like take it and not get defensive or upset and say, oh, I'm sorry, or, oh, have a great day. I don't know. It's just like, 
it's not to raise the the stakes and argue it. And uh, because we're such a litig litigious society, I feel like we're just set to argue and this stuff just, ha you know, happens. And you're just, but I, the, the way I test and driving is like, just be, you know, kill them with kindness. Kill them with kindness. You know, if it, like someone cuts you off, just think, oh, they must be in a big rush somewhere. And yeah, that's, that's have, em have empathy yes. for others. We never know what other people are going through. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so, okay. So obviously, you know, the bigger you get, the more negative messages and positive messages you receive. How do you continue to grow and expand with your team in this company? I mean, so one thing you mentioned in when you were reading earlier, or not reading, but the intro, you mentioned making information easier to consume. So especially with like ADHD, there's information coming to you from a million places these days. And so some of it, a lot of it's noise, but if you're like following the stock market, you want to, you know, understand what's going on. We try to make it, we try to condense it. So we do it in bold. Who? The what? The where? Why? Did, and what's this mean? What's this mean for you? That's what our, our, we try to do with our content to make it super simple to go mm. where you want to read it. And that's what I like to read. So when I see on articles on Benzinga, when they aren't super simple to read, I'm like, okay, wait, we did something. We have to change, we have to change this. What are we doing here? Because no one, I don't want to read a big, like long five paragraph thing here. So part of that is continuing to fight to make stuff easier to read, to understand, be it financial, be it sports, be it politics, like the who, what, the where, why, and get, you know, what's it mean? What's it mean to you? And like, mm -hmm. here's the, the, here's the, the pro, here's the negative. Here's how different, because right now, if you want to read that, it's hard. You don't know what, like at last night, I wanted to know what was really going on with something in the news. And you know, if you turn on TV, there's going to be one person who has one angle and then someone has another angle. So it's, everyone it's, has their opinion. Yeah. And so I want to know what is like the neutral opinion. What's the neutral? And then go from there. And so, so do you do you take the neutral opinion and actually create it as an opinion or as fact? What what is the information? We just try to inform and then let people decide. So, and better, like a good example would be, say you're, say um, Apple has earnings coming up. Instead of just writing Apple has earnings and you should buy the stock or what have you, we say, if you believe they're going to be positive, do you, if you believe they're going to be and the stock's going to go up, here are some ways you can take action on it. You can buy some ETFs that own Apple. You can, you know, buy some call, you know, there's different things. We're trying to give the average Joe hedge fund type abilities with like saying, here's some ways to look at it or just to make basically inform people. Like for example, this guy, Dave Portnoy had a bet on this, the Celtics and this other guy had a bet against the Celtics. And like people want to want to know, wait, what was the bet? We try to make it really, we, we try to decipher the information really, really simply. So you that's can under, nice. understand it. And that's what we try. That's what we aspire to do. And I think there's a lot more that we can do in that regard, because you understand like, for SEO, it's part write long articles. You get better rankings and uh, all this stuff. So it's you're fighting, but you're fighting, you know, both sides of things in that regard. So we try to make things simple. And I think going forward, it's not just news and content. There's data. There's tools that can make things simpler. So if you are looking at a ETF and you want to know how you, what you where you can put ten thousand dollars and not risk losing it, well, what's the data say? Like, what's the data say over the last 20 years? What happened? And that's another way to look at it. It's kind of what we do. Nice. So you're making news more accessible to people. And I love, I mean, I don't love, but I appreciate the fact of your internal struggle that you continue to share throughout this. It's like you do good stuff. And at the same time, you're fighting SEO, you're fighting negative reviews, right? Like, but you're trying to stay focused on what's going to help the people most is what I hear. Well, hundred percent. Cause if you can help people ultimately at the end of the day, that's a positive and people get better for that. And they come back to you and that you build trust. You're not going to please everyone. I know that. Like I, I know that it, it's, but I do think in general, there's a net, like people just think people are out to get them. And that's what I, that's what I would say. I don't know why that is because I feel like if people didn't think that in general, 
to be a lot more successful. Part of me building this thing up and uh, building Benzinga is getting advice from others and trusting others to help me over the years. Now, sure, some people were probably not great, but like there were some people that were so good that like I, they were so good that I'm like, okay, what what do they want? What's their angle? And they never had an angle. And this one of the guys I'm referring to did like sold his company for like two or three billion dollars. He let me. He was asked if I wanted to invest in that twenty five million dollar valuation. I didn't because I didn't have money then. Whatever. But my point is, he was just so giving. People get inspired by passion. You actually just made me think of something. Someone did text me like two weeks ago that wants to the second time to get advice, and we went back and forth. And I forgot I didn't get back to him. And that's a you know blemish on me because I like someone that's passionate and I, and if he thinks I can help him, not saying I could, but if he thinks I can, I want to for sure be there to, uh, you know, try to do that. Right. That's how the world goes around. That's karma. I mean, we're, we're here for such a short life. And you know, one other thing that, um, Brooke, I don't know if you've ever watched him, but I just saw Jerry Seinfeld in, in an interview and he was talking about, oh, this famous philosopher, I got to look it up, but basically all the, he, he, he had a movie coming out and, He's like, I can't wait to see the negative hate on it because it doesn't matter because it's going to be for such a short time in this lifetime. The negative hate is in such a short time. So his movie comes out, doesn't do, let's say it doesn't do well, which I don't think it did, called Frost, Frosted something, and is on Netflix. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so for three months, he'll get negative stuff on it. He you know, lives 85 years. It's such a small amount of time. So the negative thing about you see something on, online on any of these websites, and it's such a short amount of time. That's why, like, Ignoring the noise. I talked to you about that CEO who has people who say negative stuff and doesn't read it. Honestly, why should he? Like, if he's doing his thing, takes care of his family, does his best for his team members, and that's what he's doing. That's what he's here to do and best for his clients. Like, there's going to be people that just are angry, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Especially when you're successful. Yeah. Yeah, totally. If it's okay, I want to pivot a little bit to the user of Benzega. I want to just, uh, I'm curious on like, what's, what are some strategies that you recommend as a CEO to stay updated on your financial news that you put out there without getting overwhelmed as a consumer? So, I mean, strategies I do is I try to turn some stuff off at certain times. Like I won't necessarily go read news at a certain time during the day because I know it'll lead me sometimes down a rabbit hole. Another thing I do is I used to open up a million articles. <laughs> I don't. I limit it now to like five unless it's like some, you know, big reason. Obviously, I go to Benzinga, but, you know, another site I'll go to is New York Post. And I just want to read um, basic, you know, fun stories. And that can take you off, lead you on a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. I try to do it during times when I'm, when it's okay for me to read this stuff. Or my other one is if I open up the windows and the tabs, I'll keep them open and I'll just read them later mm. because I don't want to do it as a mechanism to not do what I'm supposed to do. For example, this is not your question about Snap on financial news, but I, I like backgammon for some reason. I had an app on my phone and I caught myself playing it way too much and it was affecting my sleep. So I would, I would read, play it at 10 o'clock till 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. You get nothing out of it. I eventually just had to delete the app. I had to, I just deleted the app. Mm -hmm. And that has made that has made a difference. Like, you know, to the point is like you want to be outside with your kids, you're and I'm playing this dumb backgammon yeah. game. There's so many other priorities. And what is it doing for me? You know? It's it's mm -hmm. there's probably some theory, ADHD, it's distra it's distracting from other issue, you know, things I should be focused on. There's probably something I, you know, should be doing different. So part of the reason I started Benzinga was several years ago after 9-11 happened and then years later i was really good at researching small cap companies like mm -hmm. small capitalization like that are very you know and on the stock market that were very small and i would find good stuff on them and i, I created a big following on yahoo message boards with, with my research i think when you're adhd you really can go down a rabbit hole and become mm -hmm. like a, a solid expert you know i think the more you know the better you can do yeah, I think it's also like that ADHD intuition. If you like something, you see that it's um, something that people are using, that you're passionate about, following that decision to invest, but also not to invest everything that, granted, I am not a financial advisor. So 
tell me if I'm wrong here, but just from my experience in working with so many people with ADHD, being married to an ADHD family, like not putting all of your eggs in one basket, diversifying, like you said, but following that intuition and going in multiple directions based on what you have done your homework on, what you believe in, and also taking other experts' advice into consideration as well. Yeah. And I think there is some of that intuition that you you may see things before others, and then you don't know if you really are. So like, should I buy more? Should I buy? Like, for example, those GLP plays, those Ozempic plays, those losing weight plays, I should have bought 10x more than I did, right? Because eventually mm -hmm. people caught on and, and bought the stocks. You just don't know. And so the point of diversification is it's vital to, because you don't know what trends are and you don't want to work hard for money, then see it go away. And mm -hmm. so I think that it's vital to diversify. I, I also think some things are dangerous. You know, we all have, I think a lot of us, we want to, you know, get rich, right? Like it's mm -hmm. a get rich quick, like get rich quick type thing, instant gratification. And I think mm -hmm. that can be dangerous too, you know, slowly, but uh, surely type thing and do the true and true buy the S&P 500 or buy good companies. I mean, Microsoft has done well over the years, right? Absolutely. And also, I yeah, I hear everything that you're saying. I worked with a Fortune 500 man, but he was obsessed with the money that he had in his stocks. He could not wake up in the morning without looking at it first thing. You know, he would follow it, the, you know, the ups, the downs throughout the day and his moods would be affected by it. And I'm sure he's not alone in feeling that way. And I know you touched on this a little bit before. What do you recommend for people who are just uh, so involved in the fluctuation? <laughs> so for Benzinga, we have a thing called Benzinga Pro. It's our real-time news data platform. It's, you know, we have thousands of people trading off it and reading real-time news. And you, you get your stress levels up and down. There's people I know, and there's, we have users that trade for a living. So they make money. They trade for a living. It's absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. They're consistently able to do that. In up and down markets, they're, they just trade for a living. They're amazing. That person you're talking about, and the, he, he sounds like he has enough money to be retired and doesn't need to work, but he's stressing over the stock market stuff. To me, that's not the best way to live. If that person has that kind of money, you diversify. Yeah, the market would fall, but typically the market goes up 10% a year over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. By the way, I didn't want to have so much money in the market because I didn't like seeing the daily gyrations. Um, and then it's like there is some truth to be told. Don't look at it. Don't look at it so often. Mm -hmm. I mean, I sold – when I get cocky about the stock market, I have a thing on my phone. I sold Amazon stock in 1997. Mm. I have the mm. date at, at, at $10 a share. And oh, it would be like no. – it was like $4,000. It would be like worth like 800000 or $1.2 oh, million now. But, Goodness. but, but the point is if I didn't look at it and don't look, and so some of the stuff you just, you don't look at and you never know where it ends up. I, when I bought those Apple shares, I never sold them. Some from way back when. So I never, I never sold those shares. Wow. Yeah. So I've had Apple forever. Now I bought it a lot smaller amount because I used the financial advisor at the time. He's like, I hated Apple at, at, tw at 16. I hated it. And I hated it at 36. And that means like at $1, cause this was many splits and all this. And so someone convinced me not to buy as many shares, but yeah, I, um, you know, it's like you stay with your conviction, obviously if you diversify now, listen, if you don't diversify and you get lucky, you can get lucky. If my, if I would have put all my money in Apple, like by my conviction, if I, if I would have put my money that I had from my grandma, a little bit of money, all of it in Apple, that would have been worth a lot. Instead, I put a small amount in very small. It's still worth a little bit, a nice amount, but that's where the Warren Buffett thing is. If you're really knowledgeable on something, yeah, I would have, it would have been up a lot, it would have been a lot more money. But at the end of the day, why have that stress on the money with the stock market when you when life is short and you could go enjoy your family, go do activities, go help other people, accomplish things, go go to charities, fundraisers. One of the big things is I I love going to charity stuff. I I, I like charities where I can see the impact. Like that's where I I, mm -hmm. I love like. Some are health, neurofibrosis, it's, uh, children's uh, tumors in their brain or around their body at a young age. And I want a cure for this thing. And I donate, you know, 
time and my wife's on the board of this thing and money because it's such an important cause because if like these kids do not deserve to go through this sure. i like seeing people affected um this i'm friends with this guy md motivator who get who gives money away and does experiences and i'm a big supporter of his and doing stuff with him and uh that's to the point of like the stock market thing if that's the case my answer is you, you move some of that money to uh t-bills to money market funds you get paid five and a half percent and you don't have to have that stress yeah because that so person what... could get five and a half percent let's say that person has ten million dollars i'm just mm -hmm. making up a number let's say that person has ten million dollars mm -hmm. okay he gets five and a half percent or she i think he said it was a guy five and a half percent that's five hundred thousand a year mm -hmm. for doing nothing for him to do for do nothing yeah five hundred thousand a year so yeah. for his money to just sit yeah, five hundred thousand years and money just to sit. Mm -hmm. So five hundred thousand years, he could he can go on private planes. He can do whatever. So like for the stock market to go like, so, yeah, I don't know. Like that's just you know that's how I, that's how I feel. Yeah, understood. So just to kind of summarize this whole thing, like what would be your number one success tip for someone with ADHD who's starting to invest but feels intimidated? by the complexity of the financial markets. Read some basic understanding of the markets, but through Benzinga or Investopedia, like, you know, how can I buy an index fund? I would, if I was to start to invest, I would buy an index fund. An index fund is a basket of stocks. So say you like Tesla, there's ETFs that own Tesla. There's ETFs that own Nike or Under Armour. The reason I'm saying that now, by the way, if you're young, like super young, so my kids, I get them to give me stock recommendations. We buy some stocks for them. I want them to learn about how the stock market works, that they're an owner of the company. So when they go get an Apple phone or whatever, they own a piece of Apple. I like that. that mm -hmm. I'm all for that. So I'm all for that. But what I am saying to you is I think there's some danger sometimes if you, let's say, have $5,000 to invest and you buy one stock. What if that stock goes down 50%? You're going to be burned from the stock market for a long time. Yep. You're not going to want to participate in the future. So like that's the kind of things that, we, I don't want people to be afraid of the stock market. I mean, I have stock, certain stocks that I think are going to go up a hundred percent. And I, my track record's pretty good with making these calls. You want to start slowly, but surely. I think listening to podcasts are good too. We have a pre-market prep report. I do a RAS report, my podcast, and I interview financial advisors and they talk about how to invest $10,000. And the ADHD thing, information overload is also not good. You and I talked about it, how perfectionism isn't the way to go. Like you, you actually motivate me because I have something I need to do and I haven't done it. And I just remembered and I'm like, I need to get back to it. I need to do it. I need to put this and stop. I just have to do it. I just have to do it. And I just have to like put deadlines on myself. I, I have um, an, like an assistant. I think I'm going to have her start saying if this isn't, if I don't review it, she's just going to send it out. And I think I have to do that. And there's penalties to that because if it's not good, I'll look, not good and so there's penalties to that that's the kind of thing that i think we have to do so we don't so we because you know the line shit or get off the pot right mm -hmm. and so i think part of that is we 88 years we got to do that okay gotcha we have so to. so don't put all of our eggs in one basket definitely not start consuming information from easy sources that are bite size and you know start small diversify and learn from these I, sources as you go is what I'm gathering. I, yeah. I mean, there's so much information out there. So you have to decide what you want to do. Now, the truth is for the stock market, there's no better time to invest than like they would say today, because 20 years from now, is the market going to be higher? Arguably, yes. So that's how it's always been. So yes. Now I, again, don't think you put your all, eggs in all in one basket. I think you can, Money markets, you can buy a CD at five and a half percent. So, mm -hmm. you know, I if if you need the money in six months, don't put it in the stock market. Buy a, a six month CD. You have a pie, and you figure out how to allocate. And you know, hire someone too. By the way, you can get a financial advisor. You can get people to help you. Schwab has options. Robinhood has options. Like, there's a lot of different. You know, Morgan Stanley, the E Trade. There's so many different things now that you can do. We provide news and data to all those brokerages, and there's we, we try to give the average Joe the same 
knowledge is a hedge fund manager. And the more knowledge is great, but at first you just have to get started. I love that. Just start. Yeah. Yes. Just start. Or, or better this, J-F-D-I. Just F and do it. <laughs> All right. Well, Jason, it was so nice to have you on Successful with ADHD for someone who is just starting or continuing their financial literacy and uh, financial growth. Where can they find you? You can find me. Um, I'm on Twitter at Jason Raznick, R-A-Z-N-I-C-K, Instagram Raznick. Um, we have events. We have one company in Chicago. You can look at Benzinga events or Benzinga.com. And lastly, the Raz Report. Look it up, download it. There's some great interviews, a lot of celebrities, uh, your very own Brooke here. I think you'll enjoy it. I really try to ask the questions like Brooke does and gets really deep into asking, like, how do you do this? You have a great product. You have uh, lots of people on the Raz Report sharing uh, valuable information. I appreciate you having me on. Um, this has been great. And I hope I added some value to someone today. I don't know, but I hope. And, uh, you did, I, you did. I appreciate it, Brooke. And, uh, I look forward to being in touch with you. We got to do this more often. Absolutely. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of successful with ADHD. I hope it helps you on your journey. And if you need any additional support for you or a loved one with ADHD, feel free to reach out to us at coaching with Brooke Dot com and all social media platforms at Coaching with Brooke. And remember, it's Brooke with an E. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.